Okay, so here's a little screencast about Lewis structures, and we're going to start by going through a couple of Lewis structures that you've seen before, and work our way into some more advanced examples, and hopefully this will help you as you work through your problem sets, and if you really want to try some more challenging uh, samples in the future. So for our first example, I thought it would be helpful if we did one that's not too hard, but also, on the same hand, not too easy. So we're going to start with ammonia. Now, whenever you start any Lewis dot structure, you should make sure that you have the correct chemical formula. And the chemical formula for ammonia, which is a gas, is just NH3. And in class, we discussed a method to be able to predict how many bonds that we would have to form in order for this molecule to exist and that relies upon two key parameters. We're going to look at the number of electrons that each atom contributes from its valence shell as well as considering how many electrons it would need to have a completely filled valence shell which for most atoms is going to be eight electrons. And we'll see some examples of species that don't necessarily follow the octet rule. And ammonia will have one of those, one of those elements in it because it's got hydrogen in it. So, first, in analysis, we've got one nitrogen atom, and we have three hydrogens, which means in terms of the number of valence electrons that are present, each nitrogen contributes five. Each hydrogen contributes one. Well, since there's three of them, then, that means we have three present. The next thing to consider is how many each would really need. Because it's, it's all about a comparison of how many you have compared to how many you would like to have to have a completely filled valence shell. So for nitrogen, nitrogen follows the octet rule. It would prefer to have eight. Each hydrogen would prefer to have two. It follows a duet rule. Since there's three of them, that adds up to a total of six. Now the difference between what we have and what we need is going to allow us to predict how many bonds are going to form. So a quick sum of these components, and we see we have 8 total valence electrons that we have, and 14 total that they'd ideally like to have in order to have valence shells that are full. The difference between those, and I'm sure you can do this in your head, is 6. We know that each bond is really fundamentally 2 electrons, so we can divide that answer by 2, and we see that there would be three bonds necessary. That means three bonds for every ammonia molecule. All right, well now we can move on and start to make sense out of things. So we're gonna start by looking at the molecule and if you look at it we we notice there's only one nitrogen and three hydrogens. So that tells us that the nitrogen is going to be in the center and everything's going to be bound to it. So I'm just going to arrange the hydrogens around it almost treating nitrogen like it's got four sides. Now since I remember over here that three bonds would have to form, I can then say, well, that's pretty simple, one bond apiece. Now I'm not done yet, because what I have to remember to show is the number of electrons that I actually have, because the reason why atoms form bonds with each other, in a molecule at least, is to share them they all get the benefit. So this pair of electrons is shared by both hydrogen and the central atom nitrogen. This pair of electrons is shared by this hydrogen and the central atom nitrogen. But we have to be careful and make sure that we've represented all of the available electrons, which is not what we've shown here, two, four, six. But in reality, it's more than that. Look over here. It's actually eight. So the question is, well, what do we do with those other two electrons that we haven't shown yet? And the answer is, they become a lone pair. And the lone pair is going to go on the central atom, like so. And to do a quick check, and you can do this for any Lewis structure, just look at each atom and ask yourself, well, is the octet rule satisfied? Or in this case, is the octet rule satisfied for nitrogen? and the duet rule satisfied for hydrogen. So if we think about it, this entire circle by my red pen encompasses the electrons that are available to nitrogen. So if we count up how many are there, we see one, two, and then four, 
6, 8. The octet rule is satisfied for nitrogen. And you can do the same treatment for each hydrogen. Around here, this hydrogen has this, these electrons available to it, so that's 2. That follows the duet rule. And you can easily see that the other hydrogens are also satisfied according to the duet rule. So that's ammonia. The next example we're going to look at is one where it's a little more complicated. And one that actually, and later on we'll look at one where it actually breaks um, the octet rule and goes into a more complicated situation. Okay, for our second example, we'll look at something that's very, very common. We're going to look at glass. Glass is made up of something called silicon dioxide. And silicon dioxide has the chemical formula SiO2. We're going to follow the same treatment as what we just did with our previous example with ammonia, which we're first going to think about how many electrons we have present, and then how many we would need. And in this case, both silicon and oxygen follow the octet rule. So we have one silicon, and we have two oxygens. Each silicon has four valence electrons, and it needs eight. Each oxygen has six valence electrons. Since there's two of them, that means 12. And it needs eight apiece, so that's 16. If we tally these two amounts, we get 16 and 24. And to determine the number of bonds, we do the same analysis we just did with ammonia. 24 minus 16, that's 8, and we divide that by 2, because there are two electrons needed for each bond, and we get 4. So that means we need 4 bonds to form between these substances. So, let's start to see if we can take this a little further. Again, we're going to look at the chemical formula, and we're going to say, okay, we've got silicon and two oxygens, so I'm going to take silicon, and I'm just going to put an oxygen on each side. It doesn't really matter whether you put them on the top or on the side like you see that I've done here. The next question to ask yourself is, how am I going to get four bonds? Well, four bonds works out nicely if each bonding place has a double bond, and that's what would happen in this case. So between each oxygen and silicon, a double bond forms. That's four electrons that are shared between each oxygen and the central atom, silicon. Now remember what we had to do with ammonia. We had to check and make sure that we've represented all of our electrons. So right now we have two, four, six, eight that are shown, and we need to make sure that we show 16. So we've only really shown half of our electrons. So at this point, if you look at silicon, you'll notice that silicon has two, four, six, eight, an octet of electrons already around it. So we don't need to put any more lone pairs on silicon. And notice that's different than our last example where ammonia did have a lone pair on nitrogen. In this case, we see that there's a problem with oxygens. Both of the oxygens don't have the octet rule satisfied. The oxygen on the left only has four electrons available to it. It needs four more. So I'm going to give it two lone pairs. And I'm going to repeat the process for the oxygen on the right. Now we're just going to do a quick count, make sure that we've shown all of the valence electrons that we should. In this case, it's 16. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. Double check to make sure the octet rule is satisfied for each. We've already done it for silicon, so let's look at oxygen now. And we see that there are 2, 4, 6, 8. So that's an example of a species that contains multiple bonds, but nevertheless, this mathematical analysis helps us to understand and predict how many bonds, and then we can very quickly draw it out from there. The next example is going to be one that doesn't follow the octet rule. Okay, now it's time to talk about some trickier ones. And in this case, we're going to start with sulfur hexafluoride. Sulfur hexafluoride is a fascinating gas. 
It's very, very dense. In fact, if you've ever inhaled helium gas, you notice it makes your voice lighter or it sounds higher. When you inhale sulfur hexafluoride, which you should never do, by the way, it actually lowers the pitch of your voice. So you sound a lot like Barry White. And the problem with inhaling sulfur hexafluoride, unlike helium, which will naturally escape from your lungs, sulfur hexafluoride will stay in your lungs and asphyxiate you. So stay away from that stuff. Although there are some cool YouTube videos, especially one um, by one of the guys from Mythbusters, where he demonstrates the effect upon your voice when you inhale sulfur hexafluoride. Okay, so let's do the same treatment as we have done in the other two examples, and think about it very much the same way. The key thing to recognize is when you see something that's a formula like SF6, when you see that there are six fluorines, well, those six fluorines have to be bound to sulfur. So automatically we know that we're dealing with a situation where a substance does not follow the octet rule. And you'll typically see this with elements like sulfur that are in period three or below the periodic table. And the reason why these can form some unique compounds is because within the third energy level, you actually have a d orbital. Even though sulfur doesn't have electrons, in the d orbital, that d orbital is still accessible and it allows sulfur to be able to form hybridized bonds that actually take advantage of some of those d orbitals. So let's get back to the problem. So we're going to have to approach this problem fundamentally differently, but there's a couple of tools in our tool chest that we can use to help us through. First, we're going to rely upon how many valence electrons each of the atoms provide and use that as a baseline to help us solve the problem. So we've got one sulfur and we have six fluorines. So in terms of how many valence electrons are provided, and you might remember we, we used this similarly in the past two problems, but here we're going to be using it completely differently. Sulfur provides us six. It's in group 6A. It provides six valence electrons. Each fluorine gives us seven. Since there's six of them, that's a whopping 42. So total we have 48. 48 valence electrons that we have to show. Now, normally we would also think about how many we need, but the need really relies upon us being able to say, does the substance follow the octet rule? Does it follow the duet rule? And we can't say that for sulfur. Now we can say it for fluorine, but not for sulfur. So we're going to take a different approach. First, we know that sulfur has to be the central atom. It has to be because it's the only one. So I'm going to start by drawing sulfur in the middle. And then if you think about it, we have to form at least a single bond between fluorine. And another, th another way to help us think about this is, well, fluorine by itself has a Lewis dot structure down here in the lower left. That looks like this. Notice how there's really one vacancy where we'd like to form a bond. That gives us an indicator that fluorine only really wants to form one bond, a single bond. So we're going to arrange these fluorines around sulfur and start by just forming a single bond. Okay. So we've all formed a single bond between fluorine and sulfur. The next thing we want to make sure is that any elements that follow the octet rule, that they have an octet of electrons. The only element that we need to worry about in this problem that follows the octet rule are the fluorines. Now you notice the way that I've drawn them, each fluorine only has two electrons around it. So I'm going to complete the octet for each of the fluorines. Try and do this faster. Nothing is more entertaining than watching your instructor make dots on a screencast. So there we've got it. Now what I have to be careful with is, okay, I've drawn at least a single bond between all of the bonding atoms and the central atom, and I've also completed the octet, but I need to make sure that I'm representing what I know to be true, which means I need to represent 48 valence electrons. Well, just do some counting at this point. So we've got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 6, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, 40, 42, 44, 46, 48. What do you know? 
So for sulfur hexafluoride, this is an exception to the octet rule. It tends, it forms this particular structure here. Hope that was helpful. Now when you get to other problems, there can be a situation where if you count up all your electrons, you still have some that you would represent. The rule to remember is if you have any additional leftover valence electrons that you have to draw in your Lewis dot structure, those lone pairs should go on the central atom. So if I did have an extra pair of electrons, I would put it on sulfur as a lone pair. Hope this was helpful. Have a great night.